briefly about ICD or our advocacy committee. It started three years ago because ICD wanted, wanted to be more involved in the field of OER and how, how we in ICD could help and support our members for advocacy on OER. So I have been the chair since that time, and we are working with all regions and we have ambassadors from all uh, six regions around the globe, which are those ones, which are my very nice colleagues. So the agenda for today is about to start off with some global challenges and also some brief notes about COVID-19. And then of course on open education and the UNESCO OER recommendation. And I will present and discuss with you some quality frameworks for OER and some recent initiatives and then with conclusions and recommendations. I hope that agenda will be fine for you. And please um, write your, your questions and remarks in the chat or in the Q&A. And I will be happy to discuss this uh, very, very interesting area with you. <clears throat> so first of all, we all know about the large global challenges about digitalization, equity, inclusion, climate change, sustainability. We may have to bear that in mind when we're talking about open education and uh, especially on OER. We also know the situation due to COVID-19, which affected all over the world with 190 countries and 1.5 billion students from pre-primary -prim and tertiary education. And as you see from the map, all over the world was affected. And it has been uh, reported uh, also by all over the world that open education and OER was one uh, thing which could um, remain education and also to which uh, put education in the forefront with the area of openness and open education. I just saw this on my feed at Facebook just before the presentation. It was from Greta Thunberg's feed actually. And of course it was about climate, but it goes to more or less everything about there is no way going back to the normal because the normal never was and then the normal will never exist because what is normal for you is not the same as for me. What is normal here in my country in Sweden may be not be the, the same kind of normal in those countries you are from. So there is no normal. And the only way forward is to go forward and to learn about the lessons. I know that there were some pre uh, questions about um, how the COVID had affected uh, the use and the implementation of OER. So I will try to come back to that as well. There is no normal um, how, how it was. The only way is to go forward and to learn from the lessons, as I said, and see the opportunities and how that can fit all, you, you, all of humanity and the nature. Uh, even before uh, the COVID, uh, we had the UNESCO SDGs, which was launched in 2016. And we know that I think it's important to start with that one when you're talking about OER because um, OER is not the goal as such, it is to reach the uh, SDGs and maybe the only way to reach the SDGs for 2030. Because if you should build a university a day, serving all the people around the globe, you have to build one university a day. And that is not desirable, it is not uh, possible. And we also know that SDG 4 have, has an impact on all of the others, not at least the one on health which has been very explicit during the COVID. Uh, <clears throat> so why is open education important? It expands access to education, enabling every person on earth to access and to contribute. It improves the quality of education. It makes education more affordable, improves student success, foster collaboration with the culture of sharing and co-creation. It gives instructors uh, the tools to involve students, to work with the students as collaborators, not to see them as we and them, uh, to generate pedagogical innovation, and also to foster international partnership and global particip participatory culture, learning, creating, and sharing, and corporate cooperation. And the other backgrounds are that Openness is a way of being and relating what we're doing in our daily life. 
and also what is paid by taxpayers should go back to taxpayers. I've already talked about the SDGs as a background for open education, but we also have the principles of social justice. And there are especially four interrelated principles, and that is equity, access, participation, and rights. And you see that goes again back to the SDGs. Um, there are some open principles we are talking about, and that is about non proprietary it's not uh, that it is mine or yours, they are shared. It is about participatory and inclusive uh, approach that anyway one can be part in the conversation and to develop uh, the culture of learning, transparency, shared decision-making and control. There is not any hierarchical uh, command or control. <coughs> um, personalization or customer, customizable to be built upon and made personal and local. We have heard, all heard about uh, globalization, think local, but act local. Access, collaborative, iterative, meritocracy, that good ideas come from anywhere, anyone, and diverse perspectives are valued and the community. You can also see the global education uh, commons uh, shown in this uh, image from um, Paul Stacey from Open Global, Open Education Global. And you see OER is just one part on, in the area of openness. There are others like open data, like open government, like open science, etc. But when you will look at OER, it is, of course, very much about uh, materials and uh, resources as such, but it also comes together with uh, uh, diversified academic views about educational practice, about open pedagogy, about assessment, about quality assurance, and open tenure and promotion and business models. So we need to bear that in mind as well, that open educational resources is so much more than the resources as such and that is also shown by the UNESCO OER recommendation and I will come back to that later. <clears throat> it is important to see the whole education ecosystem. We have both the teaching and learning, research and the public community service and there are so many stakeholders involved like students, educators, administrators and the government. <clears throat> So when the UNESCO OER recommendation was launched in November, 25th of November 2019 and adopted by all the member states, an important step was taken towards quality education and access to information for all. As was said by the general conference, um, uh, the UNESCO general conference, and it was also said at the same time that the, the use of OER and the implementation of OER is the only way to achieve the SDG for education for all by 2030. <clears throat> so the UNESCO OER recommendation is the only existing international standard setting instrument on OER, and it's the fruit of an over a decade of efforts to bring together a wide diversity of stakeholders. As I mentioned in my introduction, it started already in 2002 when the concept was coined at the UNESCO conference. So it was taken more or less 20 years coming to the space we are now by the UNESCO OER recommendation. There has been many declarations, many conferences, many initiatives, many kind of lobbying, etc., etc coming so far. And I know for sure, and that many of you as well know that the four last years before 2019, there were hard work coming to this uh, UNESCO OER recommendation. And when it was launched, there were no changes from none of the member countries. Everything was taken as it was. So just to see a bit of the timeline uh, from 2002, as I said, um, 
2007 was the first public declaration by Cape Town Declaration. In 2012, we got the UNESCO Paris Declaration. And then we got the Cape Town Declaration 10 plus. And then there was this important Ljubljana conference in 2017. And then um, the 2019 UN UNESCO recommendation. Just to make it short. <laughs> I think many of you know this Cape Town Open Education Declaration 10 plus anniversary, because here again, you can see the ecosystem of the openness, uh, like um, the aspects of communication are open, like empowering the next generation, uh, connecting with other open movements, like open science, open, open access, open government, etc. Uh, open education for development, open pedagogy, and thinking outside the institution, not just the use of OER, for example, in my university, in my course, in my department, but also to the public out there for lifelong learning. Uh, data and analytics and going beyond the textbooks and copyright reform and education and opening up public, publicly funded resources. And then, of course, there is this X card, which we don't maybe know yet. So here again, you can see the, um, the holistic approach and the ecosystem of openness. So what is actually UNESCO recommendation? A UNESCO work with uh, normative instruments like conventions, recommendations and declaration. And the recommendation um, provides recommendation to the member states to certain areas, like for example, in this case, the OER recommendation. And then they also uh, support the member states for implementation. And the recommendation is also uh, flexible uh, to be rapidly adjusted to meet both um, uh, constant uh, changes, but also to, to adapt to the, the context where it will be implemented. Uh, the recommendation per se is based on the uh, UN commitments about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also about the UNESCO's constitutional commitment to that the free exchange of ideas and knowledge support sharing of knowledge using technologies. <clears throat> we also all know that um, um, OER are based on uh, open licensing, like the Creative Commons. I just uh, show those slides to remind us uh, what is the background of it? So we all are on the same kind of uh, page. And we also know that um, although it is open and free, uh, you can search for things on internet, for example, it doesn't mean that it is an OER. And you see from this slide, uh, um, just the, the one in the top on the top are what we say real OER, but those uh, and the two on, on the bottom are not because they are not free. This is another slide, what you can do with the different kind of licensing licenses. And as we, you know, there are uh, four type of licensing which can be used in six different ways. And this is what exactly you can do. Um, our colleague, uh, David Willey, he uh, quite many years ago came up with a five hours permission of OER. And that is about retain to make and own copies, reuse, use in a wide range of ways, revise, people can adapt, modify, translate or change the form of the work with others, remix, people can take uh, two or more existing resources and combine them to create new resources, and redistribute, people can share copies, copies of the work with others. And I will argue, and many with me, will argue that there are at least more two more uh, R's. And the first one or the sixth one is about recognition. We need to recognize those who are working with OER and with promoting OER, who are working with creation or adapting or whatever. And also the learners who are learning by and through OER. So the recognition aspect is very, very important. And also um, recontextualize. I know that uh, Jack Oliver was talking about that last week and at the conference uh, about open education global, 
how we can contextualize OERs into our own language, into our own context, wherever we are working. We know that most of the uh, OER nowadays are maybe in English, and that is a problem, of course, because that is not what we want, because you learn better if you learn in your native language. Uh, so we need to recontextualize. So I will argue that there are at least a seven hours permission of OER. So, <clears throat> coming more into exactly what the recommendations say. First of all, the definition and the scope was somewhat redefined. And I'm sure you have seen this before, but just uh, to, uh, to maybe read what it is. Open education resources are learning, teaching and research materials in any format and medium that reside in the public domain or are under copyright that have been released under an open license that permit no cost, access, reuse, repurpose, and adaption on and redistribution by others. So here you can see what I talked about earlier on. OER are always coming together with a license. And it is not all the licenses which are um, making an open education resource. Also the open license uh, definition was redefined and the third point was about that, of course, information and communication technology support and provide potentials for um, effective, equitable and inclusive access to OER and the, their use, adaptation and redistribution. And then it was also state, stated that there are so many stakeholders, both in the formal and non-formal and informal sector, who are in charge with the implementation of OER. And remember, this recommendation is not just for talking about it. It is really a recommendation for implementation. It is stop to talk the talk. Now we have to walk the talk. So you see the stakeholders are all kinds of professionals, both within institutions, but also outside in the, uh, in the community and in the, uh, in the society. So the recommendation, for implementation are built in five areas. The first one is about building capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. The second one about developing supportive policy. The third one is about encouraging effective, inclusive, and equitable access to quality OER. The fourth one is about nurturing the creation of sustainability models for OER. And the fifth one, actually it is maybe not the fifth, just the fifth one, it's also have an impact on all the other four. It is about promoting and reinforcing international cooperation. So for implementation, we need to build, we need to develop, we need to encourage, and we will to nurture, and we will to promote and reinforce within those areas. And above that, they have stated about monitoring and evaluation because everything what we're doing from now or from 2019 have to be or should be or is desirable to be uh, related to the OER recommendation because that, that, that is the only way we can build evidence and also to uh, make the value of the uh, recommendation, to make it lively. So there are three ways of monitoring. It is about, uh, of course, to, to uh, deploy a research mechanism. It's about um, collect and disseminate uh, progress and good practices. It's about uh, develop uh, strategies to monitoring, etc. And I think it's important to stress this because it's not just uh, to say that we are working with OER recommendation or uh, doing something about it, but also exactly more in, in how are we doing doing it and. What kind of um, areas are we targeting and how we will monitor that? There is a huge uh, range of um, uh, literature and recommendation and I took it just uh, in the slides for, for, uh, for the archive. Is it because sometimes it's good to have everything you know, covered. There are some publications, there are some documentations and there are the framework which the recommendation are built on. And that is also what UNESCO OER Dynamic Coalition 
which was started actually when the pandemic outbreak in the beginning of March 2020. They were supposed to have the conference there, but it was cancelled. But instead, they worked online to build this dynamic coalition for implementation of the OER recommendation. And they do a lot of good work. So if you're not involved in that, please be if you have an interest. Because you can rec um, subscribe to the newsletters. You can be part of uh, webinars and in the communication. And sometimes they have uh, consultations, etc. And the, those pages, um, those um, resources are from their page. Here are also some links to the, uh, the, the, the declarations and the, the documents behind the OER recommendations. And you can see it as a lot, which is built on more than 20 years research, 20 years of uh, actions, 20 years of uh, advocacy, etc. So that is also why the recommendation is so important. And it's just the 12th one from UNESCO. And as I said, it was the only one in education, in the educational sector that also really stress how important it is. Here are some other sources, um, uh, both from UNESCO and Commonwealth of Learning, which also have been included in their recommendation. I'm sure you recognize many of those um, books and reports. So uh, by that background about open education, about uh, the issue of openness, about the SDGs and what really the OER recommendation is about, the OER recommendation for implementation. I will now um, continue to um, go through some of the most uh, common um, frameworks when it comes to open education and when it comes uh, specifically to, to OER. So I hope that is fine with you. And please, if you have any questions and uh, questions, uh, please put them in the Q and A or either in the in the chat. Uh, I will start with this one from the European uh, Commission, the Joint Research Center Science for Policy Reports. Um, it is a report which was out in two thousand and sixteen about opening up education. I know that some one of you uh, recognize this one and maybe are working on it, uh, but what it is 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 um, a framework with 10 dimensions, and you see the four of them are in the corner, and they are, they are transversal um, uh, dimensions, and that is about leadership, strategy, technology, and quality. And then there are six core dimensions, and that is about content, pedagogy, recognition, collaboration, research, and access. And each of those 10 have an influence and an impact on all the others. For example, um, the one on content where you mainly can find maybe issues on OER, it is very uh, depending what kind of pedagogy you are using. And you see recognition come back here again. And about collaboration. And you see also the, the um, transversal um, dimensions on leadership and strategy. Are there any strategy within your institution, for example, working for implementation of OER? And there is, is there a leadership supporting this? Are there incentives for teachers, academics to work on this? Are there an infrastructure in, in, in place? And are there any, any kind of um, strategies for recognition for teachers who are working with this? What about, and about quality? Are there any quality mechanisms which regulate or support or um, uh, or support or um, promote the work with OER? So this model really has an uh, is built on an ecosystem that all ten dimensions have an influence within each other. Okay, I will go through those um, rather briefly those models which I will present for you, and then we uh, hopefully can have some um, discussion about them. Uh, Sam Bring from University of Tabukas in Indonesia, he wrote a very interesting article about uh, the impact perceived by faculties with the ODL framework. And he stressed that um, the use of, use of um, 
uh, OER and the benefits of OER for faculty is about integration, opportunity, efficiency, enrichment, collaboration. And um, that can enhance student learning, enhance teacher practice, have an impact on productivity, uh, be a catalyst for changing in uh, teaching practices. You see here pedagogic camps again, support non-traditional learners. <clears throat> a rather um, easy and um, rather simple uh, quality model on OER is this one. It is just a common framework. Uh, um, there is no uh, anyone who who get um, um, recognition from this, but it's uh, based on several. Um, it's a common uh, common uh, development by for sure many, but there is no reference for it. And you see here again, there are in this model there are five dimension on open education resources. Of course, there are those legal aspects about um, licenses, which you have talked about, about the business model or the funding model models, about technology, both in form, distribution and delivery, uh, the academic approach about creation and use, and of course, the policy about mandate and goals and this kind of things. And here again, uh, it is stressed about um, and the ecosystem, but also that is needed uh, policy, legal, business and technology and academic uh, approaches is, are needed at all uh, the four uh, levels, like macro level, which used to be either uh, national level, at meso level with, in the institution, a micro level, maybe with the course, maybe the, the department or and the nano level, which are, is about the people. Uh, then I will um, present another um, very useful framework, and that is the TIPS framework. This is from SAMCA. And it, uh, the, the um, TIPS is the abbreviation of the four pillars within this framework, where T is about teaching and learning processes, I is about information and material content, <laughs> P is about presentation, product, and format, and S is about system, technical, and technology. And you may recognize by now that many of those dimensions are the same as we have been discussed for the other models. They are maybe just expressed in somewhat different way, but I will take you to it. Uh, first of all, there are um, dimensions on of quality, uh, within this model, and that is about achieving exceptional and excellence. It is about um, achieving fitness for, fitness for purposes. It is about uh, achieving value for money and about achieving per perfection. And it's about achieving uh, transformation. So this is the underlying foundation behind the model. And it's built on five um, domains. That is the cognitive domain, uh, uh, effective domain, metacognitive dom domain, environmental domain, and management domain. So for example, if we go for uh, number two, it is also very important to build and create OER. So they are, they built, are built in with motivation and have an attitude which is um, desirable and um, appealing and uh, that can promote uh, learning independence and autonomy, etc. cetera. Uh, we have the environment domain, which is for speak about language, as we talked about previously, about um, you learn better when you have your resources in your native uh, language, of course, because language is so much more than the words. <laughs> But it's also about multimedia, interactivity, and embedded links to other content. content. Uh, and of course, it is about management, about how tagging and um, include uh, time management and um, business models. 
So there are five uh, domains built in within this TIPS framework. So each of them are then divided into a number of subheadings, uh, like the blue one here, the T, which is about teaching and learning processes. Uh, for example, bear in mind that your aim, your aim to support learner autonomy and uh, learner resilience and self-reliance. Um, you should adapt a gender-free and user-friendly um, uh, environment. Don't use the two different uh, complex language. Uh, about learning activities, for example, about um, um, how you can provide um, uh, and in, uh, embed uh, feedback and um, this kind of things. Um, it is very well described, uh, each of those dimensions uh, within the, the report. So we just uh, have just taken the, the headings here. So if we go further on, further on to the uh, yellow one about information and material content. Uh, try to keep your OER uh, compact in one size so it uh, can allow a standalone uh, model because then it can be built into other models as well, for example, and also linked to other uh, disciplines. Uh, add links, et cetera, to, to enrich your content. Make sure, of course, I mean, that is obvious, but make sure that the, the content and um, what you create are up to date and accurate and reliable. If you're unsure, uh, ask your peers. Um, your perspective should support equality and equity and promote social harmony and be socially inclusive. It should be law abundant and non discriminatory, discriminatory. And we have to take all the dimensions which I started to talk about, about social justice and human rights into consideration for what we are creating and what we are and how we are using OER. So this I is very much about that. Um, your content should be authentic, internally consistent and appropriate uh, locate, located. So the P, uh, presentation, product, and format. Uh, of course, be sure to, to have an open license and that is clearly visible. And remember, not, uh, not all with the CC are aware, so be sure about your license. Ensure that your OR is easy to access and engage. Present your material in a clear, concise, and coherent way. And with sound quality. And sometimes put yourself in the student's or the learner's uh, position and see what you think. <laughs> and also have some space for adding, moderating feedback. And consider which kind of format you will present your material in. Is it uh, like uh, online or is it printed or is it both? Or which kind of format do you have? And of course, open formats is uh, the best one. And then uh, finally, the S, uh, consider adding metadata and tags. And try, of course, to use free sourceware and software. Uh, try to ensure your OER is easy, easily adaptable. And the OER should also be easily portable and transmissible. And you should also be able to keep an offline copy. And it's important to uh, include a date of production because then you can uh, monitor it. Monitor it. Um, last week at this, this conference, I briefly mentioned um, about the open, e open Education Global. There was a very interesting presentation about uh, OER and blockchain, where blockchain can uh, support OER and OER can support uh, blockchain. I think that, that all those kind of new technology we have to bear in mind and blockchain is maybe one of the, the latest one with, because of, with blockchain, we can really track the changes in each of the OERs. 
So uh, another framework is uh, that this one about from Badrud Khan. He started off with uh, frameworks for e-learning with this uh, octagon model or framework. And now he has used it in several um, uh, other kind of um, approaches like e-learning, like micro-learning, like MOOCs, like OER. And he's um, right now, I'm actually I'm working together with him for the moment and we are working on the new normal because we said that uh, there's no normal to go back to because there is in some kind of new normal in one, one other way. And this framework will be adapted to that as well. But this one is about open education resources and what it, it is, this octagon, for all those models which I mentioned in the, the different areas, they are the same eight dimensions, but then they are um, 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 arranged and uh, approached in somewhat different ways, because if it is an OER, for example, or if it is for e-learning or micro-learning. By the way, um, micro-learning and OER are very much aligned with each other because OER is very much used as micro-learning as well. Of course, you can build it up uh, to, uh, to larger modules. But the eight um, dimensions in this octagon framework is about pedagogical dimension, technological dimensions, interface design, evaluation, management, resource support, ethical approach, and institutional. And I think uh, you can see the pattern of all the models I have presented so far. There is this kind of uh, holistic approach and this kind of ecosystem that each of the dimension have an impact and influence some of the others. And with, when it comes to quality, quality is not as strong as the weakest link. So if something is missing, there will be some gaps, some kind of gaps in quality. So uh, for each of those um, uh, approaches, um, there are subheadings of, for each of those um, dimensions in this octagon. For example, with pedagogical, then there are subdimensions, how you can work with open education resources with an open pedagogical approach, etc. Uh, actually, um, uh, I have myself um, written quite a lot about this and also about those uh, models which I have presented. Uh, this is um, one of them. I worked together with the European Commission um, a year ago, and where we discussed uh, quality models for open, flexible and online learning, and it was published uh, last year. Um, and I used the TIPS uh, framework um, uh, to some extent and um, developed this uh, model about um, the TIPS as with the uh, four, four um, uh, letters, T, I, P and S. And with this uh, domains which I um, presented for you and with um, also about um, uh, the purposes, about accuracy, reputation of author and accessibility. But also uh, included a 3P um, model about product processes and people, because culture nowadays is very much uh, of importance. How to build a culture for implementation, a quality framework. It is not something which come from above, from the strategy or from the management. Neither it comes from the from below, from the people on the on the floor. It is the culture in the atmosphere, so to say, that everyone who are involved the people, because they, the people are bringing things forward. It is not a document, it is not a framework, it is not a strategy, it is the people. So it be, would need to be, um, be really uh, handed by the people, by mind, head and hand, how you can build a culture, a culture of quality. Uh, this was another uh, one I wrote, um, built on the Badrul Khan framework and the tips, um, uh, the TIPS application. It was also published uh, last year in, in this book. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity, now when I have gone through some of the most uh, common um, frameworks, I would like to take the opportunity to um, maybe show, show and, um, and present some some initiatives working within this field. And one is uh, about the OER word map. It is based uh, 
again by people of of people and um, there it is built mainly like that that uh, both you and me and everyone can put information in this OER word map uh, most often there may be one country uh, specialist uh, I for example I'm uh, from Sweden uh, so people can approach me and I can uh, help them to to um, um, add their resources in this word map. By that you can see, for example, what is going on in Sweden actually. And you can click on the dots here in the in the country. And the, do, you, do you need to have resources? Do you need to have persons? Do you need to have projects which you would like to explore more? And that you can find in the map. And first, this uh, policy um, registry was was hosted by Creative Commons, but now it is together with our, um, the word OER map. So here you can find uh, policies on OER. You see those circles here in below, for example, there are policies by country and policies by coverage and um, um, a lot of resources can be found there. And also some of the quality frameworks, which we have been talking about so far. Um, I started also to talk somewhat about the effects of the COVID-19. And there was a pre-question to me um, sent by Professor Oliver this morning about what, what has really been, been the situation since COVID uh, in the area of OER. And this is one initiative where UNESCO Institute for Information and Technologies in Education uh, launched this uh, report about open education practices during COVID-19 pandemic. And there is a lot of uh, resources and a lot of um, uh, examples, but uh, maybe one uh, important thing is a model they, uh, or a framework they come up with about how to implement open educational practices. Because open education resources is, is good, but it is a wider, pers wider um, perspective, that, as, as I have been talking about, especially when you look at the recommendation. It is it, it is um, an ecosystem and influence very much about the open education practice and open education culture. And that is why those five areas are so important. So in this um, uh, OEP framework, for example, you can see uh, it is, um, of course, about open education resources uh, down in the corner to the left. And it is about enabling technology, open assessment, enabling technology, open collaboration, enabling technology, again, we have an open teaching. And here again, you see that all those dimensions uh, have to be seen as an ecosystem, as we have seen in the other frameworks as well. Um, this uh, framework, I think, is very useful about um, the OER adoption pyramid by Totter. I think many of you have maybe seen it because it is um, not really new, uh, but it is um, very useful because it says it is both about, as we have been talking about the culture as, us, as such, that individuals are maybe agents of the OER adoption, but also of course about management and strategy and that kind of culture that institutions maybe are the agents of adoption. And they, of course, have to work together. And with this framework, there are several kinds of steps. It is about access, about permission, awareness, capacity, availability, but maybe most, um, mo most important about um, volition. And of course, you can see that maybe you are, your institution are different kind of levels here when it comes to implementation. And sometimes it's good to have some kind of image to see where you are at, to benchmark yourself. And there are also, uh, as shown in this uh, image, both external uh, um, processes, but also internally determined processes. And both need maybe need to be uh, coming together and aligned. Um, recently, uh, I think it was just uh, one week or two weeks maybe, the Go uh, GIAN, a global OER graduate net network hosted by the um, Open uh, University in UK. It's a great community, so if you're not already in that community, just uh, please, um, please um, align to it. 
it is by uh, WhatsApp. It's a WhatsApp group, and uh, it's a lot of nice and nice uh, communication going on there, and the shared resources, and of course, many people who are in the PhD um, uh, process uh, they work on this. And this is a very nice report which came out, um, I think it was two weeks ago, about um, the conceptual frameworks guide, how to work on OER and also how to work with your research project on OER and open education. And there are some nice uh, examples as well. Yes, it came out the 15th of September, so it is quite not new. Um, whatever, we have been talking about different kind of quality models and the different kind of approaches. And we've been talking about the holistic uh, approach and the ecosystem. And as you have seen from those uh, frameworks uh, so far, which I have presented, there are more or less the same kind of dimensions uh, included. And um, you need to have this uh, holistic approach because uh, quality is not as strong as the, the weakest link. Uh, but of course, when it comes to implementation, it depends which level you would like to reach or which level you are at. So I think this uh, summary model by Puttitantura is very useful, where S is about substitution. An example of that is, uh, for example, if you replace a book with an ebook. You haven't really done so much about neither digitalization, neither about OER. You have just substituted a printed book with an ebook. So it is maybe some kind of enhancement because um, maybe it is more easy for most people to have an ebook than to have a book because, yeah, it depends. <laughs> but if you really would like to transform and to change, you have to go to the uh, more deeper levels with the modification and with redefinition then transformation will happen. And for the OER recommendation, we really need to take that seriously and work carefully how, with help of the recommendation, can support and um, promote uh, learning and to let the learners take the lead of their own learning pathways, to orchestra their own learning. And for that, you need transformation. You need to change the pedagogy. You need to change the management the business model. To reach for lifelong learning, you need to reach outside your institution, not to use to, just to use OER within your course, but also to reach out to the people out there, to the taxpayers. <clears throat> so all those frameworks works which I have presented take this more um, transformation approach. This is also some kind of benchmarking where you can see where you are at or would you would like to, to head. Um, also, when it comes to quality, um, some years ago, I worked uh, as a research leader with ICDE, the International Council for Open and Distance Education, which has been mentioned now quite many times, where I'm working. In, as so we are um, share an uh, uh, ambassador and also I'm also in the board for ICD. But some years ago, I, I and my colleagues, we did a report on quality models in online and open education around the globe. And it was also covering OER model frameworks. And <clears throat> some important, um, we, we, um, uh, we researched uh, over 40 plus different kind of quality models from around the world. And we mapped them in different ways if they were more like norm-based, like accreditation, for example, which is often made by national authorities, or if it was more like a certification, which is mainly used by organizations, for example, or if it was more like process-based or like guidelines or frameworks. It is important to know where you are at. <clears throat> and that is also what this um, Go uh, GN report uh, say that, there are some different differences in different kinds of strategies for different kinds of purposes when it comes to conceptual framework. So are you working more norm-based or more process-based? We also came up with some statement that um, whatever kind of model you have, or you would like to uh, either uh, use uh, one of the existing ones or adapt it to your con context, 
you have to maybe to be sure that they are multifaceted. So they in include uh, many of those uh, dimensions which we've been talking about, about the infrastructure, about the process, about outputs, to have this um, well-rounded view of holistic quality, not just to measure the, the course as such or the OER as such, the, the content as such. They need to be dynamic and flexible to move to and accommodate for rapid changes because we are living in a world where rapid changes takes place sometimes overnight, as it did with the pandemic. They need to be mainstreamed at all levels, macro, meso, uh, micro and nano level. So not, not, not just those who are responsible at the pedagogical center or those who are in, responsible at the IT center or the management team, or it needs to be mainstreamed among those who are involved, all the stakeholders. Also, they need to be, be representative to balance the different kind of perspectives and demands for various of those interested. And that again, include all kinds of stakeholders, students, staff, enterprise, government, society. And they need to be multifunctional. So you can really uh, implement this um, culture of quality within your institution, but also that this within uh, quality culture can also go beyond the institution. So even the society, for example, know that this is what this and this the institution mean when they talk about uh, quality in this area, for example, to well serve the, the society and to well serve for lifelong learning. And as we have seen those frameworks I have presented for you, they are, again, they are rather similar. They are expressed maybe in some different kind of ways or nomenclature. So how do we really support innovation with and through OER? Raise awareness. Of course, that is very important still. Although the recommendations say we need to go above, beyond awareness raising, we need to implement. But of course, you need to start with awareness raising if you're not there yet. And you need to empower individuals, which enable them to exercise their autonomy. And encourage experimentation in pedagogy and practice. That has been a rather good example during COVID-19 because everything suddenly became possible. Maybe not everything was a good solution, but it was at least um, tried. And some of those experimentations maybe will uh, have a longer life and can be um, fine-tuned. Uh, develop constructive critical learning cultures and think and act at the level of ecosystem and leverage the power of networks and the community. And again, at those uh, four different kind of levels. <clears throat> to be involved, there is another fantastic initiative. It is the Open Education for a Better World, an online mentoring program. Both uh, Professor Oliver and myself, we are mentors in, in this and have developers who are working on projects. There will be a large conference now, 18 to 21st of October, where the projects which have been working on during the year will be presented. And also actually right after this session at four o'clock, there will be a webinar uh, hosted by Open Education for a Better World. And this is really, really related to the SDGs because the, all the projects are related to the S2, at least one of the SDGs, maybe uh, several of them. One of my uh, developers, for example, uh, she is working on um, OER and assessment and the new way of assessment with and within OER. Very, very much of interest. I would also like to take the opportunity to mention the Encore Plus project, which is a European uh, project, but it also involves the, the, the rest of the globe and continents, of course. It is, was started this year. And it is, what is new for this one is about, as it is because it um, involves both education, business and innovation. And they are hosting uh, webinars. Um, I think the next one is on the, uh, this month in October. There were two already last week. And um, 
<clears throat> they have identified several challenges within those sex sectors, but the new thing is that they work with those three areas, as I said. So that is also um, an, an initiative where you can be involved. We have been talking about languages and the importance of languages. Um, and it was stressed during this uh, conference last week by OA Global. And uh, they, um, um, I didn't know it uh, so much before, but they really promoted this page about OER in other languages. Here you can um, submit your own OER, for example, in your native language. And this is also some kind of mapping, some kind of resource bank, which is fantastic. Um, finalizing, um, I will um, say that we from the ICD or our advocacy committee, we uh, did a survey in the middle of the, or in the beginning of the pandemic, because we wanted to see about the implementation of the UNESCO OER recommendation. And we got uh, actually answers from um, all over the, from all regions of the world. Um, and it was um, the answers, the respondents were by individuals, so they were not always representing their own um, their own um, country or they have mandate to, to have the, tour, the say for the whole country. But what was interesting was that, um, first of all, more or less uh, all of the respondents said that it was too early to monitor uh, about the implementation. But uh, already when we did it in May, the um, COVID-19 has just been around for maybe two or three months. Uh, they already said at that time, that the, the whole area of openness, the whole culture of openness, the whole culture and um, issues on OER and the working with and within OER had increased extremely. Uh, this report uh, has an exec executive summary in uh, those languages because we had ambassadors from all those uh, countries. So if you would like to have a look, uh, it is uh, available. In all my slides, I have all the links for everything, so. Um, <clears throat> I have also myself been involved in several studies on um, the issue of COVID-19. This one, for example, um, where um, R.S. Buscat was the research leader about global outlook in the interruption of education due to COVID-19. And this research also covered uh, most of the countries in the world. And uh, we were, uh, I think we were 35 researchers around the world and um, covered uh, all almost 70 countries. And again, um, from this study uh, and research, it was reported that uh, due to COVID-19, the area of open education, openness, the use of OER had increased extremely. And also the adoption and the willingness and the volition, and also from strategic management and leadership level. Uh, and another study is this one. Um, with Daniel Burgos and Amitili and Anita Tabasco, Tobacco, sorry, the book on radical solutions for education in the crisis. I have a chapter there myself uh, again. And uh, another one which was presented uh, also last week at the conference uh, was a global study uh, where several of us uh, researchers also um, described how the pandemic was a catalyst uh, for open education and the use of OER and open science mm -hmm. and the practice and culture of OER, of openness. So, um, uh, finalizing from now on, everything on OER, OP, OEC have to be related to the UN UNESCO recommendation and monitoring evaluation. So, let's make the journey together for a quality for a changed quality agenda. And remember, change is not driven by recommendation or strategies or policies. It is driven by people. It is driven by you and me. So, thank you very much.